Hi friends, today we are going to take up the chapter Matter Ramdas from the textbook of 9th class CBSE. Okay, let us discuss about matter. What is matter? Matter is something that occupies space and has some mass. This duster is a matter. This sketch pen is a matter. I am a matter and you are to a matter. So, matter is something that occupies space and has some mass. It also has some characteristics like the characteristics of matter are that first it, it is made up of particles. You must have seen that if we put some sugar or salt in water and leave it for some time, it mixed with it automatically. That means the two matter are made up of particles that intermix with each other. These questions can only be answered if we assume that matter is made up of particles. So we will do a simple experiment and you do it along with me. First, take up a glass. Mark some points like this. Take some water. And take some salt. I'm going to mix the salt with the spoon because I have to show the experiment to you faster and if I leave it for inside without mixing it would take some time to intermix but it doesn't mean that it won't intermix if I don't dissolve it with a spoon so first take up some, take up some water I am taking it till level 4 you see and then I will put some of the salt in it I will dissolve dissolve the salt and it's not visible and it's on level 4 only its level has not increased you can see that means that the matter is made up of particles and the particles have spaces between them that's why our volume didn't decrease otherwise if they didn't have spaces between them then the volume of the water must have increased so this means that particles of matter are made up of that the matter is made up of particles and the particles have spaces between them. Now you must be wondering that how small are these particles of matter? Very small. We will do another experiment to show that particles of matter are really very small. For that experiment you need only some things. In, in your textbook, it would be written that you can use copper sulfate or detol, but that, that would be a boring idea and you would have to go to the market, run around. You can take haldi. It also gives some color in water, so we can identify the particles of matter. So, I am going to dilute it only two times because I have to show to you. So, I am taking some haldi, two glasses and some water. I'll take up some water, let's say around this much and I'll mix. Two spoons of haldi in it, that would give a great color. You see, it has given such a nice color inside the water. Now I'll take only this much of it. Let's see. This much. Just estimating, but you can do it exactly. And then I'll put up some water. Oh, you see that the color is still there. I've diluted it, but the color is still there. That means that the particles have divided them themselves and even on diluting they are giving their original color that is the color yellow of haldi. That means that the particles of matter are very very small. If you want you can do it three to four times and the result would come the same. I'll do it one time for you. See. Now I'm going to take a little bit amount of this and I'm going to pour water in it. Oh, the 
color didn't print. So this implies that the particles of matter are very very small, small beyond our imagination. Okay, now let move, let's move on to the other characteristics of particles of matter. So we have already taken three properties of matter that is matter is made up of particles that we got to know from that activity of water and salt. <clears throat> And particles of matter have spaces between them. The intermix and the volume of the water didn't decrease because particles of matter have spaces between them. Then the third point we discussed was that particles of matter are very, very small. We did that healthy experiment, you remember? That's. Now we are going to take up this point, that is, the particles of matter attract each other. You can perform an activity at your house that if you try breaking the streams of water that's coming from a tap, you are able to break them, but then they join again. This implies that the particles, particles of matter attract each other. This solid is staying in its shape because particles of matter attract each other. This is a force that holds them together. Eventually, after knowing these properties of matter, the scientists became interested in classifying matter. The whole scientists classified matter on the basis of tatwas that were fire, sky, water, earth and fire. But the modern scientists further classified them on the basis of physical properties and chemical properties. In this chapter we will take up the physical properties of matter. That is, they are classified on the basis of physical properties as solid, liquid and gas. And let's study about solid, liquid and gas. First, let us gather some information about solids. What is solid? This table is solid. This pen is solid. I am solid. But uh, is the water solid? No, no, it's liquid. So let's start up with the properties of solids. The first property of solid is that they have fixed shape. Now you can see if you see that the table would not come, if you put the table into another room, would the table change its shape? No, it won't. It's a solid. That means it has a tendency to maintain its shape. But uh, compare it with water. If you put it in another container, then the shape changes. So, solids have a tendency to maintain their shape. Hmm, but you must be wondering that if I hammer it, then it would break. Still, we had applied a force on it, so it had to break and it, it maintained its tendency to remain a solid. Now let's move on to the second point, that is, they have fixed volume. Okay, that's a very clear point. A solid can never change its volume. Can I? No. Okay, let's move on to the very important point of a solid. That is that a solid is not compressible. Now, you just try to put this table in a very, very small room. It won't fit there. If you try to put it in a very small place, it won't fit there. That means it cannot be compressed. It's a solid. Now take only the example of a table. You put this duster inside a bottle. Inside a bottle with, you know, small cap. You won't be able to put it inside. Because it's not compressible. You cannot compress it, press it, or you know, you can just put it inside. Okay. So we have discussed the three properties of solid. One is they have fixed shape fixed volume and they have they are not compressible now you must be thinking by now uh, we can change the shape of a rubber band isn't it we can stretch it or we can just mold it around we can do anything around with a rubber band then how can it be a solid but it is a solid as <clears throat> when you apply some force on the rubber band the shape changes but when you just remove the force the uh, rubber band comes in its original shape. That means it has a tendency to maintain its shape. 
this means that it's a solid. Now, just uh, you must be thinking about sponge as well. You know, we can compress it, press it, and just mold it around. But it's also solid because it has minute air holes in it. So when we compress it, the air is escaped out, and when we just leave it, the air fills its compartments again. That means that it's a solid and it has some variations because it's having the minute holes that's why it's being compressed so we have discussed about solids now let turn, let's turn on to liquids what is liquid? is this table a liquid? or this pen? no it's not a liquid only water and other things that that have like that they are like this you can say that they are liquid now we'll study some things from which you can identify whether a substance is a liquid or not. One thing, they do not have fixed shape. You see, you take a liquid or let's say water and put it in uh, let's say this glass and it would have a shape of this glass. Then put it into this glass. It would have a shape of this glass. That says that it does not has a, has a fixed shape and takes the shape of the container. If you just spill it on the ground it would just be flat. That's what it is. It does not have a fixed shape. But of course it has a fixed volume. They have fixed volume. Even if you spill the liquid on the ground, its volume would remain the same. And even if it's in the glass, its volume would remain the same. So we can say that liquid have fixed volume. Now let's say the third thing, that's compressibility. They are moderately compressible. Which means that they are less compressible compared to the gas and more compressible compared to the liquids. So it's between not extreme side or not extreme left. Now let's go on to my favorite topic that's gas. Okay. Gas is even simpler. I should say. Gas. What do you think about gas? Oh. Gas is something you're breathing. It's oxygen, nitrogen, in the air around you, hydrogen, etc. These are all gas. But you can see a gas. You can. Bromine vapors are visible. Okay, let's take up gas. That's all business talks. They do not have a fixed shape. nor fixed volume oh my god they don't have fixed shape that means you can have you can just put this gas into another room and it would fit because it, it will take the shape of the room so it does not have a fixed shape and volume it does not have a fixed volume as well now let's talk about compressibility. It's very compressible. You must have uh, heard about CNG that is compressed natural gas. Loads of amount of CNG is compressed into a small cylinder that is transported to your homes. So it's high compressible. Do you remember that once we discussed about the attraction of particles of matter? I did take up this topic because I wanted to ask you, my friends, what would be the packing of matter in all of them? If we see it solid, its packing of matter would be something like this. Oh, 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 
Oh, tightly packed. Tightly packed, tightly packed, tightly packed. Very tightly packed. So you can just not break it or just shake it. That's it. So it's a solid. It's very tightly packed. Okay, and now let's take about liquids. Liquids are something like this, 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 this. These are liquids. I said now nah, these are moderate. Not so the extreme left, right, nor the extreme left. These are moderates. And let's talk about gas. It's like this, 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 and this. These are the real particles of gas. Okay, this is solid, this is liquid, and this is gas. Now, in gaseous state, the particles move around randomly at high speed. And due to this random movement, the particles hit each other and also the walls of container. So, you see, if there are many children in a room and they are quarreling about, they would hit each other and also the walls of that room. So same are with the gas, they are continuously moving and hitting each other and even the walls of container. That's what happens with gas. Now let's read further. It says that the pressure exerted by the gas is because of this force exerted by gas particles per unit area on the walls. Per unit area means that if this is container, then per unit area would be this, this. And they would exert a certain, the gas particles would exert a certain amount of force on this because they would randomly be moving, hitting each other and even hitting the walls of container. That's what they do. Okay. Now, uh, we have talked about solid, liquid, gas, their packetness and the solid exerting force on the walls of the container. You must all be wondering, can matter change its state which means that if it's a solid can it convert into liquid then into gas and then nothing these are the three part these are the three states of matter and can a matter change its state that means if matter is solid can it change to liquid or gas Can it? Yes, it can. But it depends upon the type of matter and their temperature. For example, you can see liquid easily converts from ice to water. But for converting an iron into liquid state, you need a lot of heat. So we'll do it with the nicest thing that's water. Let's take up the example of water. You already know what is water. Particles of matter are loosely, you can say moderately packed, moderately compressible. Do not have fixed shape but have fixed volume. So, when we take up ice, it's tightly packed. Then, we put it into a container. Say this is our ice. Okay, my mind is not that good, don't mind. And let's say it's our burner. So, if we suspend the thermometer, we will see that after zero degree, its temperature is not increasing. But we are continuously supplying heat to the container. Then where is the heat going? Who is stealing our heat? Actually, in this case, no one is stealing the heat. The ice is the person stealing the heat. The ice is taking all the heat for itself to convert into water. So, after 0 degrees Celsius, the, the thermometer would not show any increase in the temperature even on repeatedly supplying of heat until all the ice converts to water. Which means that if all the ice is not converted to water, its temperature would not increase. That would remain till 0 degrees Celsius. And we can divide it, define it in another way that is latent heat of fusion. 
Mm, now I said that I stole the heat we were supplying through the burner. Now, we know that the ice was, was the steel or the thief who was stealing all the you know, heat. But in science, the heat is said to be hidden somewhere in the container. So, it is described as latent heat of fusion. Let's take up. Something I will tell you interesting about this chapter is Celsius scale and Kelvin scale. Now, Celsius scale is, you know, it's 273. Let me confirm first from book. Because I didn't tell you like that. For, yes, it's exactly 273.16. And if you, and it's zero, it's starting, these are the starting points, zero and this. So, if you want to convert a Celsius scale to Kelvin scale, what would you do? The simplest thing you can do in that case is that, if you're given that um, the temperature of a body is zero degrees Celsius, so you will add 273, 273. Because we are taking 273 for our convenience and for easy calculation. Now we will see that it would be 273 Kelvin. Now we were talking about converting of ice to water. Now let's talk about converting of water to vapors. Ah, that's a heating process. Let's go on. Let's say we have taken some water in the beaker. Let's say we have taken some water in the beaker. Oh, it's not a nice beaker. Uh, it's a beaker and we have taken some water. Okay. And we have put on it a burner. And we have suspended a thermometer. And we are continuously heating it. But where is the heat going? It's not showing heat above 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature is not rising. So, the heat is being stolen. But who is the thief this time? The thief this time is water. As the water is stealing all the heat for, from, from our burner to make it, for, to change its state from water to vapors. Okay. So, in science we say that this heat that we are continuously supplying to the beaker is hidden somewhere inside the beaker and we described it as latent heat of vaporization okay which means that you, if you have steam, steam at 100 degrees celsius and water at 100 degrees celsius which would be more hot i think steam because steam would be more hot because it it has the latent heat of vaporization but water still has to get the latent heat of vaporization to convert into steam. So steam so steam would be more hot and cause severe burns in your hands. So be careful while dealing with the water and steam. And some things take a little shortcut while doing all this. They do not convert from solid state to liquid state but from solid state they directly convert into vaporous state. You must have seen your mothers putting naphthalene balls inside the blankets uh, in the summers so that you can take out those blankets in winters and they are not affected by the rodents and other insects. But when you open those blankets in winter, you see that those naphthalene balls are not there. So we, and nor is something liquidy left on it. So we see that this naphthalene, instead of converting into liquid state, directly converted into gaseous state. This process is called sublimation. There are other examples of sublimation too. Okay, you must have seen your favorite band One Direction perform on the concert and something, you know, something smoke and smoke was going on the stage. You must have wondered what that smoke was about. That was about when they were putting some dry ice on the stage, the dry ice quickly converted into gas and was forming that smoke and smoke around the stage. The dry carbon dioxide.
is called dry ice. Now you must be wondering why it's called dry ice. Dry ice, it doesn't make sense to us. But it does in this case. Because it's not converting into, into any liquid, it's just converting into gas. That means it's dry ice. So it's dry carbon dioxide. When you have to have, you know, some fire is going on and you want to have a lot of carbon dioxide, then dry ice is a very good you know, thing that can give a lot of carbon dioxide at a very small interval of time maybe. We have discussed about our two thieves, the ice and water, who took the energy from our burner to convert their states. Now, let us look about the phenomenon of boiling. Boiling, the boiling is actually the conversion of liquid to gaseous state. And boiling is a bulk phenomenon. You must have seen while you boil some water, all the particles come up like this out. So that's a bulk phenomena. Boiling is a bulk phenomena. It's 100 degrees Celsius. It can happen only at 100 degrees Celsius. Not below that. It needs a certain temperature. Okay, so we have first condition for boiling, second condition. And third is that. How boiling happens? Actually boiling happens when we supply heat to the particles of the water. They have, they possess, they possess some extra energy so that they can break from their forces of attraction. Yeah, I just taught you that there are some forces of attraction between the particles of matter. So they have en enough energy to bro break these forces of attraction and become free like gas. That's it. And it can happen only at 100 degrees Celsius. These are the two things that we can say for boiling. Now let's move on to the third thing. Now I, I would ask, like to ask my fellow friends some questions. If you took, take some steam at 100 degrees Celsius and some water at 100 degrees Celsius, which would be more, you know, hot and which would cause more burn to your body. So the answer I'm going to quote is steam. You must be wondering why the answer is steam. It can be water as well. In fact it should be water as well for you because it looks like that. But no, the answer would be steam. Because you see that water was the second thief while we were doing that, you know, experiment for latent heat of you know vaporization he, he it does it did not have the energy of latent heat of vaporization but the steam possessed the energy of latent heat of vaporization that's why it would be more hot and be careful while handling the steam and water thing both will cause burns now i'm going to tell you something interesting that is sublimation Okay, sublimation. Uh, I taught you about boiling. I taught you about change state of matter regarding temperature and all. And now I'm going to tell you something about sublimation. And sublimation is a very simple thing. You must have seen your mother putting naphthalene balls in the blankets uh, during the you know summer time when you're storing the blankets aside. And when you open it in the winter you see that the naphthalene balls are not there and neither liquid of the naphthalene balls. So where are the naphthalene balls gone? This is a process of sublimation. That means instead of converting to liquid, the naphthalene balls directly convert into gaseous state. Same happens with, you know, dry ice. You won't understand why like this. Uh, actually, our favorite band, One Direction, was performing recently and you must have seen some smoke coming up on the stage while they were performing and the smoke was because of dry ice. People just were just putting dry ice and, the dry, and that was actually dried carbon dioxide because of, you know, decrease, increase in pressure, they solidified the carbon dioxide. As a result, it was solidified and when it came to the room temperature and the pressure decreased, 
it automatically became gaseous instead of being, you know, liquid state. That's why it's called dry ice. Dry ice. As the name suggests, that it's it's not it's not something you know related with water. It is dry ice. Means ice to air. Now I'm going to tell you something about evaporation. You, you would say that evaporation is something you must have learned from your previous classes and it's a very you know easy concept for all of us. If I if I ask you to distinguish evaporation from vaporization, how would you do that? You've just learned about boiling. Boiling is the other name of vaporization. So if we would dis distinguish evaporation and vaporization, then it would be something like this. And I'm going to do that. Evaporation and vaporization. Evaporation is, you know, first let's take up vaporization because we all know about vaporization. It's a bulk phenomena. Can happen only at 100 degrees Celsius. Isn't it? That's what we learned about this. Okay, now you, I'll tell you, I'll explain you evaporation in context to vaporization so that you understand better. So, if it's a bulk phenomena, it is a surface phenomena. And if it can happen at 100 degree, it can happen at any temperature. That means, the exact definition of evaporation is that changing of liquid state into vaporous state at Changing of liquid state into vaporous state at any temperature be below its boiling point is called evaporation. Simple definition of evaporation. If you don't remember the definition, try to distinguish vaporization and evaporation and you will automatically get to know it. And you know, it's a very, you know, fast and noisy process. And it's a slow and calm process. That's what we need to do tonight. I know that you're smart enough. Now let's go on. Go on. Let's go. Okay. So we are here on factors affecting evaporation. First step, uh, factor is increased surface area. How can it help? Let us read the read example from the NCRT. We know that evaporation is its surface. So. You must have seen your mother drying up clothes, first she spreads it, then the sunshine comes, and then the clothes are dried. That means, if you increase the surface area, then the process of evaporation is fastened. Okay, so first is done. Now let us discuss about an increase of temperature. Okay, now I'm going to introduce to you to a new term, kinetic energy. What is kinetic energy? You must be wondering. If I run, if I dance, or if I swing myself, I possess a kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is energy possessed by moving objects. You know? So the matter possesses kinetic energy and that means that they are constantly moving. Okay, well, let's move on. And you know that kinetic energy is directly proportional to, sorry, I made the right sign, directly proportional to temperature. That means if temperature is increased, kinetic energy would increase. And if kinetic energy would increase, the forces of attraction would decrease. As a result, a change in state of matter would occur fastly. Yes, we have done it. Now let's go on a decrease in humidity. I'm going to give you a very sad example of mine. You see, if many girls are selected for the assembly, your chances 
of getting a chance to speak in the assembly decreases. Same is with the particles of matter. If there are more particles of matter in the air, then the chances of other particles converting from liquid to gas would decrease. This is why an increase in, decrease in humidity would <coughs> affect evaporation in a positive way. So, tick, tick. Now let's go on and increase in width speed. Okay. Now what's this all about? You see, if a strong wind come, it can carry you along. Can't it? Same is with particles of matter. If the wind speed is high, it will carry the particles of matter along with it, changing its state of matter. So, it's also done. And hence, we are completed. How evaporation calls cooling. This is our last point. Now, you must have seen that if you ever use nail polish remover in something, some amount of nail polish remover got stuck on your palm, you feel very cold. But why so? Why? Okay, let's take up the heated particles as heated particles as dots. Break or a break? As dots and cool particles. Particles as hmm. you know dash. I meant to do that dash. Sorry. Heated particles and cold particles. So let's say this is our hand. It's not a good nice hand, no? But it's like you know. And this is our amount of acetone. So, it's taking up all the heated particles, all the heated particles from the palms are going towards it. All heated particles have gone to it. Oh my god, it's taking heat from the palm. And then what happens is that we are left with just dashes. That is, only cool particles. That's why our hands feel cold. And hence, my chapter is finished. But my dear friends, I'm going to tell you something that's very important. You should wear cotton clothes in summer because when you sweat, sweat is actually a normal phenomena. You sweat because when you sweat, that water gets evaporated from your body and as a result, you feel cool. So, we sweat. And when we have cotton clothes, the intake and outtake of the air can go through our clothes and it will result in comfortability of us. So, hence I am culminating this chapter. Thank you.